In today's video, I want to talk about a campaign for Aberlorn, what it's going to be like to play Alariel the Radiant in the new Queen of the Crone DLC. Uh, this video will basically go through the first 20 turns of Alariel and kind of give you an idea of how to build her out. Um, the, the consensus really is that the first 20 turns of any campaign for any lord are going to be the same across anyone who plays them. But after that, as you kind of your decisions start to expand and how you really want to play the game starts to expand, um, it then kind of changes the campaign from there on. But the first 20 turns are essentially going to be very similar every time you play um, that specific lord and or faction. This video, as a heads up, does assume you've already seen the base mechanics video for uh, Total War Warhammer. So if you are not familiar with that, please Please go and watch that first so that you do understand what some of these mechanics we are talking about here. We won't go into any detail about the base mechanics, but we will go into detail about the uh, individual mechanics of the High Elves as a whole. So let's go into that. So we have Alariel the Radiant here. She's uh, She starts in Averlorn, which is a brand new starting position for her, uh, depending on when you're watching this video. This is uh, coming out. This video is coming out right alongside or, or right before the Queen of the Crone DLC. So we see her at Averlorn and we see that she has some mechanics that are geared around Ulthwan. She is the ultimate protector of Ulthwan. She is um, basically the, 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 the antithesis against chaos. So if we take a look at her mechanics here, if I look at there, there's a button that tells me that and I can't find it. Aha, there it is. So the how to play button gives you a really good, real brief overview of some of her specific mechanics. So we see Defender of Ulthwan, and how we'll, we'll go into that in just a second here, but we see Mortal Worlds Torment and then the Power of Nature and Sword of Cain. Now moving up this list, the Sword of Cain is unique to all of the elf factions of the Total War universe, or I'm sorry, the Warhammer universe, High Elves, Dark Elves, and Wood Elves in the Mortal Empire campaign. In the Vortex campaign, obviously, it only pertains to Dark Elves and, wood and High Elves. Now, the way it really works is that you have to get access to the Sword of Cain at the Altar of Cain to the north of Averlorn. And once you build um, an altar there, you can actually claim the sword for yourself. You have to be careful, though, because the sword does make you an immense powerhouse, but it does have negative... Not negative benefits, they're called penalties and they're negative benefits. <laughs> penalties to the uh, public order of those you're around. There's a lot of issues attached to it. N negative uh, diplomatic relations with other high elves. But you do have a much um, vastly increased power kind of creep. So you do have a huge trade-off if you pull the Sword of Cain. Another mechanic here is the power of nature. So basically, anytime Alariel is within a... Let's move her right here. So when she's in one of your faction's actual, um, not city, well, I guess you could say cities, but when she's actually in a province that you control, well, this should glow, you'll have a big yellow shining aura that'll ha that'll occur. And if I, when we go and attack these two locations, you'll see that, that, that pop up here. But basically that increases public order and reduces corruption of that, um, that location she inhabits. Moving on, she also has Mortal Worlds Torment. Now, once she gains control of Ulthwan, you'll see a, a little thing that'll pop up right here that'll say uh, percentage of chaos presence in the world. And it's your job essentially to fight chaos in the, the in its utmost. You, you are the ultimate kind of bastion against that. So you, unlike any other faction in the game, are, are charged with direct combat towards any form of chaos, chaos invasions in the mid to late game, uh, any kind of Norskin invaders. So that is really kind of your chief objective outside of the, uh, the unification of Ulthwan. Then lastly, we have Defender of Ulthwan mechanic and how that works here is you can see that Ulthwan itself is divided into two kingdoms. The inner kingdom, which is everything inside of the Anuli Mountains here, and then the outer kingdoms. These ones out here outside of the Anuli Mountains. That's your Kalidor, your Tiranach, your Nagarai, your Trace, your uh, Kothic, and then your Ivris over here on the left, the, the far side. Followed by, of course, Eotain, Lothurn, Illyrian, Avalorn, Safari uh, on the inside. Now, if you hover over this little thing, it even shows you Defender of Ulthwan. And it shows you the effects of what you currently have. Now, we know that the majority of the inner ring, the uh, inner kingdoms, are not held by High Elves. They don't need to be held by you. They just have to be held by High Elves. And we can see here that we've got High Elves to the south. We've got, I'm sorry, Dark Elves to the south 
and Dark Elves to the north of us, of our current location. And once we really knock them out, the Scourge of Cain, and what are these guys called again? Cult of Excess, that's right. Once we knock them out, we will get a bonus to having uh, the Inner Kingdom secured. Once the Inner and the Outer Kingdom are secured, you get an even further bonus to your public order, to your income, to your construction, to your diplomatic relations. And it'll say people, it says people's trust in Alariel is 31%. Well, that'll start to increase more and more and more, increasing your uh, diplomatic relations with other Heil factions. Now, that's important here because you don't want to be at war with other High Elves if you're already trying to defend against you know, anything coming from this region as far as scaling or anything from over here from Norskin Raiders or anything over here from Dark Elves and Blood Voyages. You want to make sure you maintain as much of Ulthwan as possible and you get it under wraps quickly. If you don't, you will be up the proverbial shit creek without a proverbial paddle in Proverbs 2114. But to start off here, you want to you want to go on the aggressive quickly. We're playing on hard, uh, very hard. You want to go on the aggressive almost, I, I would say, even quicker, maybe even on turn one. You, the thing with that is the power curve in Very Hard and Legendary is drastic. The AI makes full stack armies and then a second stack after that much faster than you can even finish your... No, that's probably a little too optimistic. But by the time you have a full stack, they'll be they'll already be conquering, is my point. So let's let's expand her army out here. Let's get two archers and then one unit of spearmen. You can build this however you want. Uh, my my recommended kind of build of choice for most beginner armies is um, two to four units of spearmen, um, some form of close combat character in between that. Uh, in this case, we can only choose spearmen because that's the only thing that the High Elves have access to, the Dark Elves have Bleak Swords. And then usually uh, six to eight units of archers. That is, of course, barring any access to units you start out with or any kind of special uh, uh, heroes over here. So we have uh, Joseph, Fer Joseph Feralis Daltarian. We're going to pop her into here as well and have her replenish those troops. So we're probably not going to go through all individual 20 turns. I'm going to give you guys an idea of how to start this campaign and how it evolves from there. But I really want to go into what directions you should be taking, what kind of stuff that you probably are not going to know about or you're going to miss in the campaign, or just some general uh, kind of stuff to know. So let's go ahead and press enter and skip that turn. Um, this is a cool time to kind of talk about this. You can press fast forward, of course, to do that. But you can press this button and this... You can see your faction, individual factions, allied faction, enemy factions, and then neutral factions. Uh, to start off with, I would almost always make these fast and fastest. That way you almost never look at the heroes. And same thing with the uh, neutral as well. This makes the turn sequence, especially if you're playing Immortal Empires, much faster. And that's only if you've actually revealed the units. It's not going to jump to them if you can't see them. Okay, there's the big aura I was talking about. Oh, Alaria the Radiant. So we can see that that is here. She's she's causing two plus two public order and plus five in uh, untainted. Now, one thing I didn't talk about I want to go into here real quick are her high elf special mechanics. Now, we did not cover this, obviously, in our base mechanic video because that is not a base mechanic. Um, let's press this one first. Intrigue and court. Now, we said that it's important to get as much of with one either on your side or conquered. That's going to be your two big things. Conquer what you can, confederate what you can't. Um, right now we have zero influence, which is that right there, the little crown. And influence is essentially, you know, this is the total amount of influence available to your faction. It can be spent on recruiting lords and heroes with powerful traits. Now, we can see here, Intrigue at the Court allows us to affect other factions that we've discovered and the such. We can press approve, improve relations, which obviously makes this jump up. They are gonna like us more. It's gonna cost us for influence and it should go up about one or two influence every time we wanna use it in succession um, until later portions or if they're at a, such a drastic low amount or drastic high amount of influence that it takes a little bit more to kind of tip the uh, tip the needle a little bit. And the same thing here with decrease relations. Now you're probably asking yourself, why the hell would I wanna ever decrease relations with anyone? Well. Intricate Court doesn't just work with you. You can also configure it to be against another faction. So let's say these two are really, they're, they're, they're at war with each other. You can improve relations to hopefully eventually quell that war and make things kind of settle down. Adversely, let's say you've got the Scourge of Cain 
and let's say Illyrian, they, they didn't mind the Scourge of Cain too much. Well, you could actually decrease relations with them so that they actually went to war with one another. So you get a lot of influence on the diplomatic arena with the High Elves, more so than you do any other race. And that's important to know because it's a very huge crux of the High Elves. If we jump in the diplomacy section here, and we unfortunately can't do it now because of the way our, uh, our, our cities are set up, but if we actually, I think if we, I unfortunately moved cl too close over to here and it, it's gonna prevent me from being able to knock this out in one turn, but. Oh, never mind. Well, auto resolve that. A close victory indeed. I like to occupy um, when I'm playing against, uh, on when I'm playing the High Elves against other High Elf nations, because Evershale is, is taken over by the Dark Elves, I more often than not just simply occupy. The massive uh, conquest penalty is not worth it. This, uh, think of it this way. The conquest penalty is only for one turn, and then the province instability, um, that is there for, just think of that as three turns deteriorating. So three, two, one, negative um, public order. This is going to be ten turns of public order that I, I just don't want to have to deal with. So I'm just going to go ahead and press occupy. Got, a little, got some missions off of that. little protector, uh, mother protector, which increases AP. Get some goodies from there. This is, of course, telling me to go make a vassalage with a vassal or a military alliance with our other nations. Now, this opens up a dock. That dock will open up trade possibilities with Illyrian. Now, you can see here that we don't, we can't see the majority of Illyrian because it is a high elf. It is, we haven't discovered majority of it because the high elves have uh, special kind of benefits with their diplomacy. If they accept my diplomatic thing, boom. I can now see all that they can see, which uh, and unlocks this, right? We only could see Illyrian, Cult of Excess, and Safri before. Now we can see much, much more of Ulthwan. So we'll go with Lothern. Let's see if this works. Oh, cool. So now we have all Lothern, which, acts, which adds Kalidor here. Um, Safari, that typically are not firm friends with us. Yeah. Safari and Kalidor are almost always aggressive towards everyone, so that's something to consider in this whole, in the grand scheme of things. But by doing those, those two quick uh, trade agreements, we were able to expand a good majority of Ulthuan and get, a, get eyes on the rest of the, uh, the rest of the continent, as it were. Now, my, my immediate recommendation is to go for Tor Saori or ASAP. You want to solidify your first settlement fast because then you can work on your commandments that'll then help out with your growth, they'll help out with uh, expanding your, your military technology, your actual research technology because almost all of um, the, the High Elves research is gated behind buildings. So you want to expand that quickly. Now, let's go ahead and actually... She can't move anymore, so we're going to recruit more. I'm going to do... We already have, you know, I'll do one more archer. So we've got a total of four archers. One, two, three, because of the Sister of Avalon are an archer unit. Then I'll make two more of them. I would pull from the global recruitment pool if I was in a hurry, but we're not because see, it costs two turns. It's got the same amount of upkeep, but it almost doubles in price. So that's important to know. Almost got, what's, what, it's like a 90, what was that, like a 97% <laughs> increase in price? 500 to 963. So... Once you've got that, you pretty much are set. You've got to uh, assign skill points. This is a good point. This is a good time to talk about this. So I almost always choose Route Marcher. That's the very first thing I ever choose. Um, with Alariel, you can go a number of ways. You can always go with the red line. And again, we've talked about this before in the general mechanics, but it's worth it's worth bringing up again. Campaign skills affect the over the campaign map in one way or another, or your army and its kind of upkeep or, or the uh, your diplomacy, stuff like that. Your red affects your individual army units and their bu and buffs to them. And then you have this line, which is gonna be unique to your casters, which is unlocks further spells and uh, subsequent abilities such as Arcane Conduit. And then your last line up here, your yellow line, well, this is yellow line as well, but your yellow line here for uh, specific traits that are only uh, locked by L'Oreal. I, it depends on how you want to build her. She's got Tradition Dictates and Blood and Fire. Each one will lock out the other. Now, if I wanted to build out more, say, Tree Spirits, I would go with Gifts of Aisha. Gives you uh, plus 10 armor for four spirits and a ward save. And this one 
uh, Guardian of the Land, which increases melee attack for your four spirits and then Winds of Magic as well as cooldown minus 15%. You can go with uh, Tradition Dictates if you so want, if you want stronger Handmaidens and Sisters of Avalorn, because as you can see, melee defense plus 10, recruitment duration minus 1. You got uh, you can you can unlock the recruitment of handmaidens without even building the building with this skill, which is kind of cool. So you can pretty much always recruit them, and you can recruit them at a plus two rank if you max this out. So that's kind of nice as well, and this gives you a, a nice way to kind of help uh, round up the entire kingdom. So just kind of depends on how you want to play Alariel. Do you want her to be very aggressive? Do you want her to be a little bit more of a, a stateswoman? So it depends again how you want to play her. And you get some additional abilities here with Chaos Bane and Touch the Everqueen, which are going to be huge. Touch the Everqueen, not as important as I'd say Chaos Bane is going to be, because you're going to be fighting against a lot of Chaos, Norska, and Beastmen. And this gives you a little bit more melee attack across the entire army as a whole. So I think it's a little bit more beneficial than the other one. But you're not gated either way, just depends on which one you want to choose. Um, that's kind of what I think is the most important things to choose out of her skill list. Nothing really stands out like it does for Hellebron, so you can really get away with uh, building Alariel how you want. Uh, you've got her Star of Avalorn quest, which will unlock. She starts with her Stave of Avalorn, which really, really makes her a healing healing powerhouse, which is really good. Um, she also gets her Banner of Avalorn, improved recharge rate, and her Horn of Aisha, which helps with uh, reload skill and melee skill. Um, that's obviously going to be huge because you're going to have so many um, archers in your in your uh, actual army. But here is that Mortal Worlds Torment thing, and this is uh, this is really this is attached to your corruption. This is clearly a hundred percent untainted. Now, if it were to drop down. See, at Alariel's faction, why chaos corruption is less than 25%. Increased leadership aura size, a huge public order bonus, huge untainted bonus. If it drops down to below to greater than 25%, you get more bonuses against fighting against chaos, which is really cool. But um, you also suffer penalties here: miscast chance, wound recovery time increase, wounds and magic power reserve. Um, so it's basically saying that okay, we get that there's now more presence of chaos in the in the world so we're going to give you the bonus bonuses to try and fight off that off but you have some serious negative negative or some serious penalties if you don't win those fights then this kind of stacks up more and more and more and more until you get to the last one here uh which this gives you a free army ability the dwellers below which is kind of cool uh, you get a bonus versus large plus 15 when fighting against chaos a weapon strength plus 50 percent um so you get a lot of bonuses here but you have goddamn near no winds of magic power reserve you have a huge miscast chance against when fighting against chaos and norska and if you get wounded you're out of the fight for three more turns than you would be normally so you do have a trade-off here it's like it's like a lot of mechanics you see in other games like in um morrowind or or skyrim when trying to balance the mechanics of, of say a vampire being a vampire means you get all these really great buffs but you have to suffer all these huge penalties same thing here if you, I, I personally would just recommend staying <laughs> sub 25% because you get a lot of other, there's a lot of other corruption benefit or uh, penalties that you get that are not listed on that, uh, that, that tick up as you um, accrue it in your land. So it's outside of those penalties she gets, you'll get the actual chaos corruption penalties themselves. So definitely worth noting. So we can see that it is uh, doing its thing. Now, Gain Veil, vale, how I'd recommend building this out is going to be very dependent upon how you want to play. Um, I almost always like to build a public order building here, and I'm going to swap out this building when we take out Tor Sarir with um, another building. I'll probably put the military building here and a uh, growth building here as well to help build the growth of the entire faction. There's no reason to waste you know, the building browser, a tier three building in a in a faction or in a build in a uh, location that can get up to tier five it's just a waste at that point but again however you want to build that out we've kind of gone over in the base mechanics what the ideal settlement is like but i always recommend in in just your settlements not your actual provincial capital um in your uh settlements you go with um one defense building one economy building either growth or 
income. I'd recommend growth over income in, in the first starting st stages of the game, followed by any kind of unique resource or any kind of other building that makes the most sense. Maybe a military building, something that, that helps you out, um, that, that is not going to be gated by the, the limit of a, a settlement's rank uh, tier 3 capabilities. Um, so one thing I want to point, to point out here is quest issued for the Shield Stone of Aisha. Now this Shield Stone is really, really good. It gives a ward save, it gives a 12% Physical resist bonus and missile melee defense. It's an amazing, amazing item, and you get it really fast because all you have to do is capture and occupy the Phoenix Gate. Super simple. Um, everyone has got like some one or two actual hidden items that you are not like this in your skill sheet. Take, for instance, the Armor of Midnight for Malekith. If he has over 6,000 slaves and goes and takes Ball's Anvil, he unlocks the Armor of Midnight. Take the uh, Shadow Crown for Elithanar. He can unlock that through a series of, of sequences. Or uh, Hellebron's Magic Amulet. You get it every any whenever you pick up the... Uh, or the Sword of Cain over here at the Shrine of Cain. It will eventually unlock her, uh, her Magic Amulet, which is huge. Like a 33% magic resist in an aura around her, her so very 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 beneficial so let's move all the way over to here because we want to beat Safri here Safri is going to race us to Torserer and honestly you don't really need to do much at this point you can take a look at your diplomacy again you, you know, in the beginning of the game you want to check this more often than not but for the most part, you're not going to be able to do a whole ton in the beginning until you build up influence, until you start smashing other Dark Elves. Because as you kill other Dark Elves, it's going to increase your standing and your relations with other High Elves. And we'll go over here and just destroy this. Auto-resolve that. We lost a unit of Archers, but that's okay. Um, for this video, I'm doing these uh, auto-resolves. It makes a lot of sense when you're that close to just do the actual battle. Um, I chose auto resolve because it's just I'm trying to make this a little more succinct and not hour and a half long. So we got a, we we secured a province. We unlocked the invocations. So let's talk about those as well. Now we have got the rights panel. Now we have the invocation of Lilith, the invocation of Assyrian, the invocation of Aisha, invocation of Val. Now Lilith is uh, unique to uh, Our Lady here. And it is, uh, it, every single one of the new lords gets a, a new right that is unique to them. So the way this one works is the patron of seers and prophets, she is prayed to for clarity, prophecy, and foresight. This increases your rank and uh, your, I'm sorry, this increases, increases the rank of Sisters of Avalorn and the hero recruitment rank for handmaidens, increases the dryad, the armor of your dryads, and the recruitment cost for handmaidens is reduced significantly. So that's your unique one with Lilith. And as always, guys, we have the requirements to unlock all these. Um, the invocation of Aisha was simply to main control or secure a province. Um, the invocation of Assyrian, this one will unlock after reaching rank five with your faction leader. This one will unlock after reaching three, after researching three technologies. And this one obviously we'll do once we construct the world's roots entrance withered building. And these are your cost to do these invocations. Oh, that's not the cost. Whoops. Followed by the cooldown duration. If you're getting this, you just hover over it. It tells you most of the stuff. And then the effects duration. So it lasts for five turns, five turns, ten turns, ten turns. The Invocation of Vol is really cool here, though, because it does... A Dilemma will offer a powerful magic uh, magical item. So if you click this and you perform this right, you'll be able to craft a magic item, and it'll give you some options of what those magic items will look like. You're not just locked into something. So you can choose between one to... Uh, I think it's three to four magic items. So the Invocation of Vol is really cool, because for 1,500, you get a very strong magical item that uh, is going to benefit either just your lord or your lord's and army as a whole, so that's important to note. So now that we have captured Torserir, I am again, see, we've already got a militia camp here, perfect, let's break that one down here. Let's actually even expand this to uh, another rank. Usually I would rate, I'd wait to just do this one, but since we're, we're kind of... You have to bum rush the Phoenix Gate. And we have to get enough stuff produced to do that, so I'm kind of in a hurry to attack that Phoenix Gate, and I want to get some additional public order and some uh, growth out ASAP. So by building this next building, we'll build a growth building here. We'll also increase our public order here, and we'll take a, a L'Oreal, 
actually give her some better... You can build this however you want. There's no, like, m optimum way to build a lord. Because that optimum is not how you want to play. You want to play how you want to play. If you want a lord that's, ma that's amazing at taking care of his army, then just, or her army, go to the red line. But... There's not a whole ton here worth it except for maybe Bowmaster, because Bowmaster is going to increase the, uh, the, the effectiveness of your your uh, archers, and your Lord and Sea Guard, your Sisters of Avalor, and stuff like that. The only things that buff your Tree Spirits, are, again, are in the Blood and Fire line over there. So she's taken this building. We're going to recruit some more Spearmen and another Arch. Actually, we'll do one Spearman to two Archers now, since we lost one. And when that finishes, we'll move them over. Oh, we also have an unassigned skill point with the Handmaiden. The Handmaiden, again, um, I like Stimulate Growth because I think it's really strong, but so is Replenish Troops. Depends on how you want to play the campaign. If you want to be super, super aggressive, I would go with um, Replenish Troops. If you want the Handmaiden to kind of float wherever Alariel does and you want Alariel to not be that aggressive, go with Stimulate Growth. For this, we'll go with Replenish Troops because we have kind of a wounded army here. Then you get to choose which of these three you want to go with. Diplomat of the Everqueen obviously has bonuses to trade, to diplomatic relations, to influence, which is really good. Uh, Protector of the, Fe the Everqueen is bonuses to the army. Gives you hit points. Makes, gives her the ability to have Guardian. Gives her the Entangle ability, which locks something down so they can't move. Or Lieutenant of the Everqueen, which basically means that she's, uh, she's stronger in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Or, well, combat as a whole. Increased range, increased missile and reload time, and then Hawker's Precision. So she's a much better archer, as it were. So again, build the handmaiden how you want and how you want that handmaiden to be. Because you might have different multiple handmaidens and you want them to have separate roles. Um, we do have the option here. Let's actually cancel these. Because we have a commandment. We're going to use this. We're going to issue this commandment. Oh, that commandment won't kick in until next turn. So, so never mind. We'll, dis we'll demolish this building. We'll increase that. Because you really time is of the essence in these first 20 turns. So you want to make sure you get everything out ASAP. And we're, we're nearing the end of this video here, guys. I wanted to, again, just... I'm not going to go through every little thing here, but I want to talk about some of the finer points, give you guys some initial ideas on how to play the first couple levels here, or the first couple turns. Okay. It's actually... Stop that. I don't want her to produce that archer yet. We'll move her further this way. And you can you can set her to move faster through this button as well. So my faction, I can make it so that her, her speed is fast. So if, if that bothers you. It doesn't really bother me. Um, two, let's go one, two, three, four. Let's go five. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And eight for that. That's good. We'll just make one more archer. Well, you'll, I'll show you why. So, we're we're at a turn five here. You got 15 more turns really until the first 20 are over with. Um, we're gonna end this turn. I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about what I would do from this point on, uh, because this is pretty much a really good point to be in the game. We we have solidified the majority of our initial hold onto Avalorn. We've secured Avalorn as a whole. That is now our, our, our province. And now it's a matter of deciding how and what direction we go in. So you probably saw that last little thing that said Blood Voyage. Well, Hellebron has a unique special rule that ma makes it so that she summons a Blood Voyage after Death Knight every time she wants to sacrifice 800 slaves. Now, what does that mean for you? Well, a Blood Voyage will be deployed from Harganeth Harganath is right there. And it will sail across the ocean, through the Sea of Chill, through the northern straits of the Great Ocean, down here, and make landfall around the sunken lands. Now, you've got these gates that dot the outside of Ulthuan. Eagle Gate, Griffin Gate, Unicorn Gate, and Phoenix Gate. We're about to take the Phoenix Gate, so that's not a big deal. But you can see right here that the murder party, as I like to call it, the Blood Voyage is on its way. It's going to walk right through that gate. And do you want to know why? It's because this Blood Voyage is... The very first Blood Voyage is not at war with anyone. It is intentionally meant to get over to you as fast as possible. To show you exactly how this mechanic works. 
You even start with military access to Illyrian right off the bat, which is good, because otherwise you'd have to trespass to go and get go and attack that um, that murder party fast. So let's see if we can grab any other trade agreements here. Good. We're in a good position here. We're, we're, we're scooping them up. That's good. We want to get those trade agreements because it's just going to help our economy out. Man, look at that. We're really, really, we're really racking them up. Okay, you got to calm down, Safari. So we can see now that that's going to be our next target. That's going to move much closer to us in this next turn. We can actually build some more stuff from our settlements here, so we'll make that building. We'll probably build... Um, you can you can wait to tier 3 and make your Handmaiden's Gallery if you want. You can even put that in a in a settlement. Uh, making the world root entrance is probably important because it just there's a, there's a victory condition attached to it. So or I'm sorry, a right that's attached to it, so you might as well start building it ASAP. Let's end this turn here real quick. And kind of after this, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that Blood Voyage, the Phoenix Gate, in those directions. So keep in mind then that, as you can see, everything's starting to move around because I can now see them. But um, that Blood Voyage is going to waltz right through those gates because it's the very first one. On every subsequent Blood Voyage after this, they will start at war with all the other High Elf factions, which is good. It means that in order for them to get through these gates, they have to fight the gate to get through it. That's a very, 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 very huge note to note because those gates are going to be the main thing that protects your inner kingdoms. You cannot get to the inner kingdom aside from those gates or the south entrances through Lothern and the Glittering Tower. So it's important to note that because this allows you to really kind of plan how your defenses are and where your armies are going to be. You know, maybe Reaver's Mark is going to be a big bastion of military recruitment for you because th they changed the way the gates are. The gates no longer house multiple buildings for uh, army recruitment like they did in, previous, in the previous version of the game. They're just simply the gate that has like five tiers to it. So do keep that in mind if you are coming from previous games or previous versions of the games. But essentially, we would come over here, attack this. I don't think we can even reach it. Okay, we'll, we'll auto resolve that again, just for sake of things. Yeah, sure, just forced labor, whatever. And that'll kill Jildu, Jildua, Jild, Jild, Jildau, and we'll have destroyed the Blood Voyage. But that's not forever. That Blood Voyage will come back in due time. So after that, your your next course of action. This is turn seven. So your next course of action is to take the Phoenix Gate as soon as possible. The Phoenix Gate does have a pretty good um, amount of defenders on it. It's got two Black Guard of Nagaron. It's got some Black Guard Corsairs. So you can actually decide to wait and, and um, bum rush the Handmaidens as soon as possible with the uh, Handmaidens Gallery. Or you can just take this army and attack the Phoenix Gate. I've done it. I did it. It's fine. You do not get to create ladders. Or I'm sorry, you don't get to create battering rams or siege towers against the Phoenix Gate. You have to just take it by brute force. So that's something to be mindful of. I, I split my army up in half to do it, and that, that allowed me to take the, the gate pretty well. Um, but let me actually load in another uh, one of my saves, which is just a little bit further down the line here. And I'll talk a little bit more about that before wrapping everything up. So as you can see, we're a little bit further in the campaign on this save. Um, we have a lot more controlled as Averlorn, and some of the other factions have grown bigger and squashed out some of the other ones. So let's take a look here. So I already control the Shrine of Cain. That has got to be your number one priority after taking the Phoenix Gate, is bum rush that Shrine of Cain. If you do not bum rush the Shrine of Cain, you will have to deal with an NPC faction holding it, and they will get fat fast because the Shrine of Cain is very easy to hold. Um, I did not build the building here, but let me show you. Make, make, let me make a point. So the Shrine of Cain has, this is the, um, just the rank two defenders. I'm building a defense building, which will add that. But the, the Shrine of Cain, where is it? Has this building, the Shrine of the Widowmaker and the Abandoned Shrine of Cain. If I add the Shrine of the Widowmaker, it allows me to have Phoenix Guard and White Lions just default in the, the garrison. It's so huge to take those out. Then if I build the Ancient Waystone, which gives me Waystone Fragments, I'll have a Moon Dragon and a High Mage there. So you build these two buildings, 
and then your defense building, then this thing is impregnable for the most part. AI is not going to be able to knock that out of your control. Um, they're going to need two stacks to do it because on top of what you're going to get from a rank three building, whew, it is no fun for them. Trust me. So you have to take the Shrine of Cain ASAP. Outside of that, I would spend all of your influence possible to confederate with Lothern ASAP because the faster you do that, the more control you'll have over the map. Lothern, unlike the other High Elf factions, does not simply just confederate and go to war and stuff like that. They won't try to confederate with everyone. They'll try to eradicate them. So they'll say, okay, I am Lothern. Oop. I am Lothern. I'm at war with Kalidor. Kalidor is gone. I'm going to delete Kalidor off the map. The next is probably going to be Safari. They're already at war with Safari. So they'll delete both of them and then probably move into to Tor Everest. So if you confederate with them quickly, you'll be able to stem their growth. You'll be able to have a southern expansion base, which is important because you want Vol's Anvil. If you're playing on hard, having two of these um, um, ritual resource sites, I, I needed the name up to tell you what it was. Ritual resource sites is going to be fine. It's, it's all right on hard. But if you're playing on very hard, it's going to be damn near impossible. You're going to need to get way more ritual resource sites. And the closest one is this one right here. Ball's Anvil 2.0 over here on um, on Nagaroth. So you'll have to expand out that way to get it. There's another one over here somewhere or another. Yeah, like that's the next one. I think this is uh, the Black Tower of Arkham. So it's it's not easy to get resource sites for Alariel. She's very starved of that, and that makes her very challenging. She's very aggressive too, because like I said, she has she's the ultimate king of the hill. She has to hold all of Illyrian. And if you can see, we are the defender of, of Ulthuan. All of Ulthuan is under High Elf control. This is again only turn twenty four. So. We've progressed along quickly. We've captured what we need to capture. I've kept Trace in Trace's hands so they can be, act as a, a bastion against scaling in the north here. And I can then come to the to the aid of anyone I need to go to while I confederate and conquer the remainder of Ulthuan. Once I do that, I'll then worry about expanding. But for your first 20 turns, you want to very you want to focus on bolstering Avalorn, taking the Phoenix Gate taking over the Shrine of Cain, confederating then with Tyrion, and then lastly, just unifying all of Ulthuan in the next, I'd say, 40 to 60 turns, so depending on how long it takes you. But hopefully, guys, this gives you a really good idea on how to play Alariel as you start the Queen of the Crone DLC. Um, and if you've never played this game before, hopefully this gives you a really good entry into the series so it's not too intimidating and too scary. Um, you'll find as, as you play through more, more stuff will unlock, like the Shrine of Cain right here, Sword, the sword is unavailable. Uh, well, you have to actually make the Shrine of Cain and construct the Shrine of the Widowmaker before you can actually draw it. But you'll, you will discover that as you play it. Um, only other little quick tip to note here is in between these moments, like right now, there's relative peace for me. I'll probably take a Lariel, bring her back into the Inner Kingdoms, and float through the Sea of Dreams and Dusk to look for little... Where are they? So we'll look for this... Look for the little mysterious islands, little stuff here and there, and then just get the campaign buffs because that's a really good way to just get some quick experience. I'd say one, two, three. That's probably 4,500 experience and 4,500 gold worth of uh, items and or experience, depending on how it's all, all set up. So it's worth it just to kind of float around every so often to pick those up every like 20, 30 turns. So. Uh, I want to give a huge shout out here real quick though to Lord Master of Sotek. He did help me out with some of the uh, campaign mechanics. He's definitely the master of campaign. So he helped me out with uh, some things that I didn't know about in uh, all three of these uh, upcoming campaign videos. So if you haven't checked out his channel, please go check out his channel. He's doing a uh, live stream of Alariel. He's done one of Hellebron, and I think he'll be doing a Lifanar here as well soon. But thanks so much for watching here today, guys. If you have any other questions and you want some more knowledge on how to play Alariel, or just in general, what, what the best way to approach certain campaigns are, please let me know. This will be a rolling series that I uh, kind of come out with um, as time permits. But thanks again so much for watching. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and all that jazz, and have a good one, and take care.